Day after day, we are surrounded by the presence of criminals. We are spectators to the deepest darkness in human actions and the bizarre reality that someone's suffering can be a form of pleasure. As dedicated investigators of the criminal world, we're on a mission to uncover the most shocking crimes and get inside the minds of those who commit them. I am Luke, and today I bring you another unreal true crime. The Case of Rua Pedro Teixeira This horrible case took place in Lausada, a village situated in the northern region of Portugal, a location known for its vineyards, renowned green wine, and its distinction as the youngest population in the country. Nestled in the heart of the municipality bearing the same name, this village is in close proximity to the northwest coast of Portugal, a hub of summer enjoyment for tourists hailing from various corners of Europe. Within this quaint village, on January 28, 1987, Rui Pedro Teixeira was born. His parents, Filomena and Manuel, lauded his lively and jovial nature, along with his remarkable creativity and imagination. In a nutshell, this family, complete with their youngest daughter Karina, led a harmonious and contented life. Rui Pedro was a bundle of energy as a child. After completing his daily school assignments, he engaged in spirited soccer matches with his beloved cousin João André and other local children. His aspiration was to become a professional goalkeeper, and thus he consistently played in that role. Among the boys' other pastimes was cycling, and he could often be spotted zipping through the village to ensure he reached his daily math tutoring sessions punctually. However, one shadow cast over his otherwise serene childhood. Rua Pedro grappled with epilepsy. Manuel and Filomena were the proprietors of a driving school. One day, an ordinary young man named Afonso Dias arrived at the academy with aspirations of obtaining his driver's license. Filomena swiftly discovered that Afonso was facing financial hardship. Renowned for her exceptional empathy, she immediately sought ways to assist him. Initially, she provided him with clothing, and as their bond deepened, she extended the opportunity for him to work at the school, enabling him to earn extra income. Three years passed, and thanks to Philomena's kindness, Afonso became a truck driver at just 22 years old. The family trusted Afonso so much that they relied on him to pick up Rui Pedro and Karina from school and bring them back home. To do this, Afonso used his brother's car, a Fiat Uno. As they spent time together every day, an unusual friendship blossomed between Afonso and Rui Pedro. The family didn't think it was strange, especially because Afonso had a youthful and childlike personality, which made him and Rui Pedro feel like brothers. However, the maternal grandparents viewed their relationship with suspicion. Manuel, on the other hand, was concerned about Afonso smoking around the child and considered him a bad influence. Worried about the consequences of this friendship, Manuel talked to Philomena about it, but she was convinced of Afonso's good character and believed he meant no harm. In the end, like in any good marriage, they reached a compromise, with Philomena agreeing to keep an eye on their interactions. On March 4, 1998, around 2 p.m., Rua Pedro rode his bicycle to his mother's workplace, which was just a few blocks away from home to tell her that Afonso had invited him for a ride in his brother's car. Filomena wasn't happy about the idea and told him not to go. Instead, she sent him to a nearby field where his friends were waiting to play soccer, emphasizing the importance of making it to his 5 p.m. class on time. Though he was initially disappointed, Rui Pedro obeyed. He removed his bicycle helmet and headed to the soccer field. When he arrived, he found his friends, except for Jo Andre, whom his mother didn't allow to go out. Surprisingly, a black Fiat Uno driven by Afonso pulled into the field a few minutes later and stopped beside Rua Pedro. 
They had a short conversation, and then the child put aside his bicycle helmet, got into the car, and bid farewell to his friends through the passenger window with a simple gesture. Between five and six in the afternoon, a phone call shattered the family's peace and marked the start of the Teixeira family's worst days. Rua Pedro's tutor called to inform them that the boy hadn't attended his class. This was highly unusual since Rua Pedro had never missed a class before. Panic set in as his parents feared that an unexpected epileptic seizure might have rendered him unconscious, potentially causing severe brain damage if he didn't receive prompt attention. The news quickly spread throughout the village, and concerned residents sprang into action. They organized small search teams to cover the entire town. Soon, they found their first clue. A neighbor reported that around 3 p.m., he had spotted Rui Pedro's bicycle hidden among the bushes near the soccer field where he had been playing. Manuel and Filomena knew their son very well. They understood that his bicycle meant the world to him, and he wouldn't just leave it behind without a good reason. This led them to believe that Rui Pedro might have been taken against his will. Without hesitation, they rushed to the police station to report his disappearance. Upon receiving the report, the police launched their investigation by questioning the three boys who had been playing soccer with Rui Pedro. These friends recounted how a black car had entered the field to pick up their friend, identifying Afonso as the driver. They emphasized that Afonso's behavior had been strange and controlling toward their young companion. Initially, the officers doubted the children's accounts and chose to disregard their statements. However, they mentioned the misleading lead to the mother, which raised her suspicions. Filomena then mentioned Rua Pedro's request from that same afternoon to meet up with his friend. Immediately, everyone's attention turned to the truck driver, and the authorities proceeded to search his home. Afonso welcomed the officers who wanted to ask him some routine questions. As the last person who had seen the child, his statement could provide crucial information. However, the truck driver remained unusually calm and claimed not to have seen Rua Pedro. His reaction raised suspicion among the agents, given the numerous testimonies they had collected. Consequently, he was taken to the police station for further questioning. Once at the precinct, Afonso attempted to offer an excuse. He mentioned that his brother had asked him to take the car for its annual inspection, a mandatory requirement in Portugal for vehicles over eight years old. However, records showed that he had never attended the scheduled appointment for that afternoon. Afonso persisted with his story, continuing to deny that the child had gotten into the car hours earlier. He admitted to a brief encounter of only five minutes with Rui Pedro before 2 p.m. Afterward, he claimed to have driven to a nearby town, which was about 15 kilometers from Lausada, and parked in front of a pharmacy. Afonso asserted that he stayed in the car for a while before deciding to take a stroll through the city, even mentioning that he admired the shop windows. When he grew tired, he drove to his girlfriend's house, arriving at 6.45 p.m. The woman lived in another village in the region, just 11 minutes away from La Sada. Meanwhile, at the police station reception, Rua Pedro's grandfather and cousin anxiously waited, determined to apply pressure to expedite the investigations. When Afonso's interrogation concluded, the two of them crossed paths with the suspect in the hallways. Upon seeing him, the grandfather desperately inquired about his grandson's whereabouts and offered anything in exchange for an answer. Afonso broke down in tears and insisted that he didn't know where the child was, but he warned that if they wanted to find him, it was essential to close all borders because he had probably been kidnapped and was on his way to a foreign country. The cousin also confronted Afonso and even mentioned a conversation they had with Rua Pedro the day before. The man's only response was to shout at the boy to be quiet once and for all. But the cousin remained unfazed. On the contrary, he continued the narrative with more details. Afonso had offered to take both of them to meet prostitutes and said that the meeting point would be a vacant lot. Following these events, a large-scale police investigation was launched in the region, involving local residents, firefighters, and even the assistance of bloodhounds to find the trail of the lost child. 
The officers believed that the boy might have had a seizure and was unconscious somewhere in the village. Or maybe he had simply wandered far away and couldn't find his way back. In summary, they considered it a case of a search and rescue, ruling out the hypothesis of kidnapping. Rua Pedro's family was outraged by this approach to the case. Due to the extensive dissemination of Rua Pedro's images in the local media, a sex worker recognized his face and contacted the local police. She stated without hesitation that on March 4, 1998, a black car had stopped in front of her on a desolate road. The driver offered her $10 to have sex with the little boy who accompanied him. She asked how old the boy was, and the man replied that he was old enough. The woman took him behind some bushes by the side of the road and looked for a private place where no one could see them. There was no sexual contact. The little boy was very terrified, crying nonstop and repeating over and over again that he wanted to leave. Seeing the child in such a distraught state, the sex worker couldn't help but feel compassion for him. She spent around 15 minutes trying to comfort him. She hugged him tightly and assured him that everything would eventually be all right. Amidst his sobs, he confided in her that he had been forced to attend that meeting. After emerging from the bushes, the child got into the car, and that was the last time she saw him. All signs pointed to a kidnapping, but even with this compelling witness statement, the police still hesitated to fully embrace this theory. In a desperate plea, the family begged the authorities to act urgently stressing that each passing moment could be critical to the child's survival. The following morning, just after the court's opening, they managed to persuade the public prosecutor's office to request the intervention of the judicial police, a specialized agency responsible for investigating serious crimes like homicides, kidnappings, organized crime, and terrorism. Within 24 hours of Rua Pedro's last sighting, Several judicial police officers arrived in the town. In the subsequent days, alongside family members and neighbors, they meticulously calmed through the entire region, suspecting that Rui Pedro might have been left somewhere. The distribution of posters featuring the child's photograph escalated, reaching a national level, and the entire country of Portugal was deeply shaken by the case. The disappearance of the child sparked an overwhelming sense of collective sorrow. People referred to Rua Pedro as Our Boy or Our Little Pedro. Simultaneously, the family began receiving a barrage of phone calls, many of which were tormenting and distressing. Some claimed to have Rua Pedro in their custody, while others provided leads to his whereabouts that ultimately led nowhere. The most audacious callers even demanded a ransom payment. One particular and terrifying call featured a child whose voice sounded eerily similar to Rua Pedro's. Amidst screams and tears, he desperately called out for his mother. Citing the challenge of tracing all communications, the police decided not to pursue any leads that came through phone calls. The family's desperation grew, and the omission of potentially valuable information for the ongoing investigation appeared both inept and negligent. In April 1998, one month after the disappearance, a suspicion emerged. A renowned Portuguese journalist traveled to Disneyland in Paris with his wife and children for a report intended to be published in a widely read magazine with national circulation in Portugal. The article featured a series of portraits of him and his family at various park attractions. Among these images, one particular photograph raised alarm bells. In the background, a small child could be seen with a man dressed in red. Philomena and Manuel saw the photograph and firmly asserted that it was Rua Pedro. In September of the same year, a significant breakthrough occurred as the British police dismantled a pedophile network in an operation known as Operation Cathedral. This organization primarily operated online and served as a database with thousands of photos and videos depicting sexually abused children. This operation gained high-profile attention due to the unusually large amount of pornographic content possessed, produced, and distributed by this organization's members. Shockingly, they discovered more than 750,000 photos and 1,800 videos. 
Out of the 1,263 individuals featured in the seized material, only 17 were identified. One from Argentina, one from Chile, one from Portugal, six from the UK, and seven from the United States. Philomena confirmed that Rui Pedro appeared in some of those photos, confirming that he was still alive, but nothing more. There were no coordinates or leads to his possible location. The British police speculated that members of the network had abused him on camera and then potentially harmed him. Over the next 13 years, the public ministry of Portugal built a case against Afonso, who consistently maintained his innocence. The trial began in November 2011. The key testimonies came from Rua Pedro's three friends, forming the backbone of the case. While the judge could verify certain facts presented by the prosecution, the court dismissed several testimonies due to a lack of conclusive evidence. In March 2012, Afonso was acquitted. On Rua Pedro's 27th birthday, January 28, 2014, a video was published that quickly went viral on social media. Some actors voluntarily participated in this video campaign. Their aim was to search for new clues about Rua Pedro's whereabouts while also including the email addresses of the Northern Board of Judicial Police and the Portuguese Association for Missing Children to ensure that the young man's case would not fade into obscurity. This campaign had a broader goal of denouncing child trafficking for sexual exploitation. Returning to the legal proceedings, Afonso's freedom was short-lived. After an appeal by Rua Pedro's family in 2014, a new ruling from the Porto Court of Appeals sentenced him to three years in prison. This sentence was for inciting a minor to engage in involuntary sexual relations, but it was not related to the kidnapping or any other charges linked to the disappearance itself. Despite Afonso's defense attorney filing an appeal, this second ruling was confirmed by the Portuguese Supreme Court. On October 3, 2014, the resolution was ratified and on March 18, 2015, Afonso was taken into custody after the police issued an arrest warrant. He was released on parole in March 2017, having served only two-thirds of his sentence. Afonso continued to maintain his innocence, claiming to be the victim of a grave injustice. Twenty years after the disappearance in 2019, Rui Pedro was officially declared presumed dead. The police concluded their search as no further leads had emerged since Operation Cathedral and the case had gone cold. The young man's whereabouts remain a painful mystery. Despite the ceaseless pain and the enduring void of not knowing what happened to her son, Philomena did not give up. In 2007, she founded the Association of Relatives of Missing Children. Rua Pedro's case highlighted a grave issue. We are confronted with a deeply serious phenomenon. Every year, three million children are kidnapped worldwide. In Portugal alone, there are over 60 missing children and minors. And that's the end of today's case. As always, I appreciate your support for my work. If you subscribe, like, and share this video, it will help me continue creating content. This was another episode of Crime Analysis Central. See you soon.